Ignition and liftoff. aircraft carrier, in this case a supercarrier on one of the world's seven seas, on deployment with more than 5,000 officers and men for more than half a year. A self-sufficient, fast-moving, floating airbase, remarkable for that. And because, as one commander put it, it's like steering Manhattan Island around from the top of the Empire State Building. What is more remarkable is the skill that goes into making it do what it does despite being as small as it is. A veteran pilot described the flight deck as O'Hare and Washington National Airports at peak hours, squeezed into a few basketball courts. A tight and dangerous environment in which inches or inattention can mean catastrophe. But, he added, think of it also as the most formidable floating weapons system ever devised. The aircraft carrier, having demonstrated its value in World War II, and in the years to follow, in Korea, Vietnam, the carrier has, during those years, developed and implemented many new and advanced technologies. Nuclear power has given the carrier unlimited range and mobility. The canted or angled deck first explored by the British and introduced into the U.S. Navy in 1952 and now employed on all aircraft carriers, has substantially improved the flight deck efficiency and the safety for pilots and flight deck personnel. No longer does a pilot have to face parked aircraft as he lands. A missed arrestment now is no more than a touch and go. The steam catapult, Another British invention has increased launching power over six times that of the old hydraulic systems, thus effectively increasing the complement of aircraft that can be carried aboard, together with increasing the strike power of the heavier type of aircraft that can now be launched. The landing signal officer guiding an approaching aircraft onto the deck with paddles has been replaced by a variety of more sophisticated technologies, such as the Fresnel Optical Landing System, or Meatball and the landing signal officer's heads-up display console, which can give quick and precise guidance information to the pilot of an approaching aircraft under any light, weather, and sea conditions. And what all this technology has achieved 
is the most concentrated offensive airborne firepower from an airbase at sea. This is the home of the carrier's air wing of more than 75 airplanes, nine or 10 squadrons, each with its own type of aircraft, each with a distinct offensive or defensive role to play. The aircraft carrier's purpose is to move its air wing close enough to any threat so as to take the battle to the enemy in any weather. enabling its strike aircraft to put bombs on the target. And to allow its interceptors to reach and get the jump on hostile platforms. Aside from the air wing's ability to come to the carrier's defense, the boat, as the men affectionately call it, and its planes also rely on the vessels that lead, surround, and tail it. The flat top goes to sea as the core of the battle group, which may be composed of as many as a dozen fighting ships, each with its own mission, each joined to the others by a network of electronic data links. Though dispersed and separated from the carrier by hundreds of miles, yet linked electronically, its submarines, missile cruisers, frigates, and supply ships can continue to carry out their individual and integrated missions. But most important, the battle group is able to extend its operational capabilities far beyond the horizon. Though the carrier will leave home with everything it needs, resupplies of food, jet fuel, ordnance, medical items, replacement parts, Everything from engines to earplugs can be delivered thousands of miles away. And so, there are the resupply ships, able to rendezvous with the battle group whenever and wherever they're needed. In addition to the air wing personnel aboard the carrier, about half the ship's complement includes the carrier's permanent personnel, who are responsible for making all the ship's systems work. When not deployed overseas or on a cruise, the air wing is shore-based at naval air stations around the United States. Before they go to sea, pilots, naval flight officers, enlisted air crewmen, and all support people go through intensive training cycles ashore, where the skills that make an air wing work as an integrated unit are taught. Simulators for each aircraft make it possible for air crews to become proficient with everything from cockpit procedures to nighttime carrier landings to sophisticated combat maneuvers conducted in incredibly realistic environments. One location for actual practice is at Fallon Naval Air Station in Nevada, where individual squadrons come together as an air wing to learn to fight as a team. The closest to the real thing is practiced against squadrons of different type aircraft, simulating enemy fighters, flying enemy tactics. Intercepts and strikes coordinated with electronic jamming and deception measures are then conducted on ranges against ground targets defended by simulated SAM missiles and ground missile sites. The results are then critiqued with the help of the Cubic Corporation's real-time visual display of who made it and who didn't. Strike Warfare Center School three weeks of flying around the clock for the carrier air wing. Once integrated training at Fallon has been completed and before overseas deployment can take place, the air wing will have to demonstrate its operational capabilities by taking a final exam and several weeks of demonstrating operational readiness at sea. But the true test of whether the objective has been met will be an ongoing one, resting on the officers and men who will handle and fly these airplanes at sea. During a typical air operation, the rescue helicopter is the first to leave the deck and hover in standby status near the ship. Tankers would take up their positions overhead to be available for airborne refueling demands, day or night.
In a mission requiring fully integrated support, the E-2C Hawkeye, with its all-seeing radar rotodome, would be up and on station to keep a far-ranging eye on any air or surface threat hundreds of miles away from the battle group and, using voice or silent data link transmissions, vector the fleet's fighters to intercept and neutralize any danger. The variable swept-wing F-14 Tomcat fighter interceptor designed for all-weather fleet, air defense, and air superiority would follow. It can defeat enemy aircraft from sea level to an altitude of over 80,000 feet, from dogfight range to more than 700 nautical miles away. One of its prime missions is to destroy enemy bombers before they get close enough to launch their cruise missiles. The A6E Intruder is the Air Wing's low-level, all-weather, long-range, day and night attack bomber. With a crew of two, a pilot and BN, or Bombardier Navigator, and able to carry missiles and rockets, it would be launched to deliver five 2,000-pound general-purpose bombs or up to 28 500-pound bombs on targets hidden by darkness or weather. Aside from supporting strike aircraft with its electronic countermeasure systems, the EA-6B Prowler would be called upon to play a key role in defending the fleet. The EA-6B uses its electronic capabilities to protect the carrier battle group against long-range bombers, radar-homing anti-ship missiles, and is able to clear the way for Navy and Marine strike aircraft to disorient enemy air defense systems by jamming or destroying them with the harm missile. The A-7 Corsair is the Air Wing's light attack strike day bomber and close air support aircraft. It can carry air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles, general-purpose bombs, and is outfitted with a 20-millimeter cannon. It is in the process of being replaced by the multi-mission F-A-18 Hornet Naval Strike Fighter, now joining carrier air wings, a high-performance, multi-mission, single-piloted aircraft. A balance of high aerodynamic performance, digital avionics, and high reliability and maintainability make it an effective replacement for the F-4 Phantom and the A-7 Corsair. It is capable of conducting fighter missions beyond 400 nautical miles. The S-3 Viking has a crew of four and can attack submarines at long ranges under all weather conditions. The S-3 can also lay mines, attack ships over the horizon with its harpoon missile, and refuel other air wing aircraft using a buddy store. It carries 60 sonobuoys and can range 1,000 miles for more than two hours without refueling. The four-man SH-3 Sea King twin-turbine-powered helicopter with its dipping sonar can detect, identify, track, and destroy enemy submarines as well as perform search and rescue missions and cargo transfer operations. And there's the COD, Carrier Onboard Delivery, a long-range transport roomy enough to deliver jet engines, critical spare parts and personnel, as well as pick up and deliver the welcome mail from home. While some carriers may differ in structure and layout, the focus of all carrier operations is here on the roof, or flight deck, with its four steam catapults to shoot aircraft off the end of the deck with enough velocity to allow them to fly. And with four arresting wires to capture returning aircraft. All of it watched over, presided over, some say owned by the man in the yellow shirt, the air boss, who is a commander and veteran pilot, who now serves as a kind of ground and air traffic controller, airport manager, and key safety officer, all rolled into one. He's assisted by a similarly qualified aviator known as the mini boss. Air crews, in fact, 
All hands look to the air boss as the officer with the final responsibility for safely launching and recovering all aircraft. His commanding view is some 140 feet above the sea in a glass and steel enclosed bubble known as PriFly or primary flight control, which for greater visibility protrudes from the ship's towering superstructure. Uh, about Commander Greg Southgate probably. is the air boss on the USS about Constellation. His short definition of his job and what to we, ensure uh, that things are done what by we the do book. Here is, is, uh, I have a very large communications uh, suit that enables me to talk to all the people I have to talk to, including the aircraft, obviously, to do all this coordination. And I have, obviously I also have a lot of windows to, uh, to watch the deck and to see the way we do things, uh, to make sure it's safe to make sure that we're not gonna run one airplane into another. We work in very, very close quarters with our aircraft. So we track the airplanes when they launch uh, to make sure that we get them all back. We track their fuel states. We track uh, the condition of the airplanes because periodically an airplane will have a problem airborne and we need to know when to bring him back, when not to bring him back. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we have to get the others on board before we take a chance of bringing him back so that should something happen to him, I don't have a bunch of others out there and no place to land them. People on the flight deck are all color-coded uh, by their jerseys. And uh, the reason for that is quick recognition. Uh, we've got probably five or six different color shirts that we put people in. For example, I wear a yellow shirt which is kind of traditional uh, for the air boss in the air department. But uh, also the yellow shirts generally designate directors. Uh, these people are the ones who are more qualified. They are the ones who physically tell the pilots how to maneuver their airplanes as they're taxiing around the deck. Uh, we also have the blue shirts uh, who are my handlers. Those are generally my younger fellows and they are primarily there to tie down the airplanes, to chain them down. Uh, I've got purple shirts who are my aviation fuels people. I've got white shirts who are generally uh, safety type individuals monitoring safety all around the deck. Also my corpsmen, my medical people are in white. Uh, the aircraft troubleshooters who are members of the squadrons are in white. So that if an air crew calls and says, I need to see a troubleshooter, I know when one has arrived on the scene, and uh, that way I know the airplane's getting the help he needs. Uh, we have green shirts, and those are all my catapult and arresting people. Resting gear folks are all in green shirts, and uh, as are most of the squadron technicians. But the bottom, re bottom line reason for all that is so that we can quickly identify and uh, designate who should be where. The men in the fire protective metal suits are the carrier's on deck crash crews, the firefighters, the rescuers. The people in red move and service the bombs and missiles and other armaments. Those wearing brown jerseys and frequently seen on the ladders leading to the cockpits are the plane captains. The cycle of taxiing Positioning, catapulting, recovering, maintaining, fueling, and parking aircraft on the carrier requires precise logistical controls. Here in flight deck control, all the wing's aircraft in scaled miniature form with applied symbols denoting maintenance, armament, and fuel status are positioned and moved to replicate the position and movement of the real ones in the hangar bay, on the deck, and recovery and launch. The flight deck can be highly dangerous. Because of the high noise level on the flight deck, communication is coordinated by a series of unmistakable hand signals. The daytime launch sequence, for example, can be understood through these very firm commands.
sensors in the carrier's air traffic control center will keep track of the flights that have been launched, those that are due to leave, planes that need mid-air refueling, and the ones scheduled to return. During landings, the flight deck officer will signal clear or foul deck, depending upon the safe or unsafe condition of the deck to accept inbound aircraft. In this case, the airplane has taxied off and the deck is clear, as indicated by the green light at the end of the runway. Once safely aboard, the aircraft rolls back slightly, dropping the cable, and the pilot is directed to raise the hook. A crewman called the hook runner will then signal that the wire is clear and that it is safe to retract it. The pilot is directed to taxi clear of the landing area and the deck is prepared for the next landing. The same basic signals are used during night operations but with lighted wands by men who can be identified by the reflective designation on their helmets. This rapid but well-organized sequence of activities requires detailed training and many closely monitored rehearsals. The new crew members learn their jobs by the numbers, learning when, where, and how to move in this dangerous environment, here on the flight deck. Well, if you get, let's say for example, I've got 47 airplanes on the roof here, and uh, we have a large launch of 30 or 35 of those aircraft, in a very confined space, such as a flight deck, uh, you've got a lot of jet blast, you've got a lot of heat, you've got a lot of moving parts out there on the flight deck. We have on the, on the flight deck, general, on this flight deck, uh, four catapults and four normal sets of arresting gear that we use uh, to recover the airplanes, to stop the airplanes for the arresting gear. We have a fifth wire, if you will, uh, that we also put up a large net associated with that. It's called a barricade. That is an emergency only usage uh, piece of equipment that uh, is there should, for example, uh, an airplane's hook break. His resting gear hook, if it breaks while he uh, launches or in the air or he can't get it down, he has no other way to stop his airplane. We can then raise this barricade, which is a large 20-foot high net that goes across the landing area, and he can fly into it. Strong enough to snare an airplane heading for it at 170 knots. There are rehearsals for the real thing. Crash, fire, and physical injury simulations. Deadly serious exercises to stay current on ways to contain possible damage. Meanwhile, constant rehearsals by air crews to keep them qualified for day ops. And the more demanding night landings. Well, we have four wires uh, on the aft portion of the ship of our resting gear wires. Any one of them is fully as capable as the rest to uh, stop an airplane. But the further aft that you go, the number one wire is the furthest aft that we have. Uh, for an airplane to catch that means that he is lower than he should be. And we would like to provide the airplane, uh, or have him provide himself, uh, the maximum clearance that he can over the back end of the ship before he lands and still catch a wire. So the ideal target wire, the one that he's trying to, trying to hit, is the three wire. And so we have uh, varying distances, but essentially we've got about 40 feet between the wires, between each wire. So he's got a very small landing area that he's shooting for. The pilot approaching the deck has about a 200-foot safe area to land in, down the middle of the deck. And if it's an F-14 with a 64-foot wing spread, he will have very little clearance between parked aircraft on either side of the deck while traveling at about 135 knots. It's also important to remember that while he's moving, the ship is moving forward and rolling, and the deck may be pitching up or down. 
It takes intense concentration and rapid eye-hand coordination. And after a tough combat mission, fatigue can become a factor. We have the LSOs on the Lieutenant platform. Commander the Gary Tritt. Aboard. It takes an extreme amount of concentration on the pilot if all your systems in the aircraft are working and the ship is uh, giving you information, uh, automatic carrier landing system, or the ILS is up, then the pilot is, is at a point where he has to then put all the concentration towards that effort and to fly the aircraft down to a good start on the ball so that as you come in for the landing from a half a mile to three quarters in, you have the parameter set up and you're able to fly the ball all the way down without gross deviations. The biggest problem being is that if you're tired or if you have an aircraft problem and the variables with the ship itself, then you rely a lot also on the LSOs and on your reel to be able to give you uh, instant feedback on what you're doing. Striving to reduce the risks and improve the safety margins for pilot control and flight deck operations, new technologies are continually being developed. Together with advanced aircraft navigational aids, there are sophisticated guidance and control systems that range from automatic throttle, which maintains the proper approach angle of attack of the aircraft, to the FA-18's fully automatic, hands-off recovery of aircraft, directed by interactive radar-controlled shipboard guidance. The basic idea is to roll into the groove or to line up correctly for the approach about three quarters of a mile out and to remain on the glide slope by keeping the light on the deck called the ball centered within strict parameters. This optical glide path system consists of a gyroscopically stabilized array of Fresnel lenses projecting narrow beams of light. The pilot flies the desired glide path by keeping the yellow ball level with the green reference lights. He also has to keep his aircraft lined up with the center of the runway while maintaining the precise angle of attack, assuring the correct airspeed. If he is above the desired glide slope, he will see the ball above the green lights and must correct to lower his glide path. If he's low, he sees the ball below the green lights and corrects to increase his glide slope. If he is in the final stages of his approach, and is so low that he sees the red ball on the bottom of the display, the LSO may wave off the aircraft and instruct the pilot to go around and try again. There are only 12 seconds from when the pilot enters the groove to touchdown. This is all the time there is for the LSO to decide if a wave off is necessary. The LSOs, all experienced pilots, standing behind the windscreen on the aft port side of the deck, will radio corrections when they see that a pilot is having troubles. The LSOs particularly watch for aircraft to line up with the center line, which is very difficult for pilots to judge. The LSO is the final authority on whether each aircraft is safe to land. After each landing, the LSOs prepare written comments to be used at the pilot's debriefings to follow. Lieutenant Commander Bob Ewan is one of the two staff LSOs for the USS Constellation's carrier air wing. There are four arresting gear wires or cross-deck pendants rigged under normal operations. We target the third one. We, can, we have the ability, or the air boss in primary has the ability, to target any of the wires. We can set how, or he can set, how far down the deck he wants that pilot to touch down. And once again, though, that's only in the case of him flying an ideal glide slope. So that, that'll tell us, just a quick look, it tells us how far down the deck we're targeting. We normally use a three and a half degree glide slope. Uh, the, we have the capability to go to a four degree glide slope, and the Air Boss and the LSOs together talk about that and decide we will switch the four degree glide slope and under high wind conditions, which is usually 35 knots or more or extremely gusty winds. We do that, to, it just gives us a little more hook to ramp clearance, and if the deck's moving and, or the winds are gusting, it just gives us a little more margin there. Slightly steeper uh, angle. This is known as a pickle switch, and it allows us to uh, communicate with airplanes without transmitting on the radio, and also is our safety backup allows us to wave off airplanes. Uh, we uh, need to wave off airplanes for a variety of reasons. One of the big reasons is if the airplane is out of parameters to land, if he's, he's gotten uh, underpowered and gotten too low and is in danger of hitting the ramp of the ship, or he's lined up too far right or left to salvage the, the pass, 
the best solution is we just pull this little trigger, red wave off lights start to flash on the optical landing system, and he knows to go to full power and go around. The other reason we may wave off an airplane is for a foul deck. A deck where the resting gear is not set, where there are people or airplanes in the landing area. There are any number of reasons why we, there's something in the way that we can't land airplanes. So once again, we would just wave them off. When necessary, to avoid electronic detection and ensure carrier security, radio silence or zip lip is maintained. The one-way commands are handled with lights. Once the pilot rolls wings level into the groove, he'll receive a quick flash of the lights known as the cut lights. A row of green lights atop the ball, which will tell him that he's next in line to land. The cut lights are also operated by the LSO with a handheld pickle switch. Should the inbound pilot need to add power, the cut lights will be held an extra second or two, indicating the need for additional power. In bad weather or at night, Sophisticated equipment coupled with a heads-up display allows the LSO team to see a presentation of the approaching aircraft before it breaks into the clear. The plat screen, which displays an image of the approach from the centerline perspective, will reveal whether the plane is drifting right or left just before touchdown. Stored on tape, this information is available to be played back to the pilots during their debriefs. Full power is always applied on landing, just in case all the wires are missed and the aircraft must pull up and go around, which is referred to as a bolter. This will allow the pilot to come back and make a landing instead of dumping himself, his crew, and a $30 million airplane into the sea. It is agreed by those who know that night landings or night traps, as they're also called, are extremely difficult because of the loss of visual references. There's no horizon and you can't see the deck. And yet, as the air boss puts it, everyone seems to get quite good at it. But according to one veteran pilot, everybody has a night in the barrel. Vertigo in, in, in flying at night is a, is a very prominent problem. Uh, a pilot has to rely on his, his instincts and his training to fly the aircraft by instruments. Believe what you see and not what you feel. The biggest problem that will occur is that guys will then begin to start, they feel that they're in a left-hand turn, they don't believe the instrumentation that they see in front of them, and they may try to correct. Henceforth, they get themselves in a lot of trouble. And then there is the weather. Heavy winds and rough seas. Sleet. Snow. Ice and men in airplanes on a slippery deck. He, he calls you at three Lieutenant quarters Mike quarters of a mile, Bouvier. should break out. And he say, okay, you're at three quarters of a mile, call the ball, which is a, a key to transition to a visual scan. And the LSOs at that point pick you up visually and start talking to you. Well, at three quarters of a mile, he said, call the ball. I looked out and there weren't, was no ball because in fact, I was still in the clouds. Uh, so I waited and waited and I'm still flying. This is about the last, 15 to 20 seconds of flight. I'm, I'm waiting a number of seconds and I'm still flying the needles down to the minimum uh, altitude and I still don't see anything. Finally, about the time I'm gonna add power and take it around, the LSOs say paddles contact, which means they see me, even though I don't see the ship, they see my landing light. They say paddles contact, little right for lineup, little power back on. So they're giving me some calls before I can see the ship. My heart's going at about uh, 400 beats a minute, of course, at this point. And uh, about three, four, five seconds later, I finally start to see something. You know, I break out, which means I get clear of the clouds and see, see an outline of the ship, pick up the meatball, which is my saving grace there, and uh, I make a last-minute play for the deck. I can't see any of the lineup because the snow's falling on the deck and melting and creating like a, a shimmering effect to where the, the landing area is not illuminated, but I see a couple airplanes on the left and a line of airplanes on the right and kind of go, well, this is about right. And I get it aboard, catch a four-wire, but uh, that was probably the toughest landing I ever had on that. Well, periodically when we're recovering airplanes, uh, for whatever reason, uh, an airplane does not get aboard when he should. He does, he's not able to catch one of the wires or the deck may not be ready. Well, fuel is obviously a critical factor in the equation. A strict procedure is enforced for carrier aircraft regarding fuel. Weather permitting, a tanker is kept in the air at all times during flight operations. 
If an aircraft has made several unsuccessful attempts at landing and is running low on fuel, it will be sent up to the tanker to refuel. In operational areas where land bases are within range, one base is designated as a divert or bingo field. But even with an airborne tanker, there isn't always a bingo field in range. Under these conditions, known as blue water flight operations, the only alternative to a normal landing is a barricade arrestment or ejection. Once everyone's back on board, the LSO visits each ready room and critiques each pilot's performance. The LSO's written comments are presented at the routine debrief, and a greenie board denoting individual grades are kept posted in each squadron's ready room and is a matter of great pride to the pilots. No punches are pulled. Rank has no privileges here. The flight deck. Day and night operations. What is equally impressive is the work that goes on below the deck. The people who are responsible for making the carrier self-sufficient live and work down here. Below the flight deck, in the workstations and in hangar bays large enough to contain half the aircraft in the air wing. Airplanes are serviced and problems diagnosed here and get fixed and sent back up to the flight deck on the four elevators. And it goes on 12, 16, sometimes 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Directly below the catapult, there are the highly trained men who adjust steam catapults to the pressure required for each type of aircraft and each specific weight. And aft, there are the four operators, one for each arresting gear, trained to set the tension on the arresting wires to match the weight and speed of the specific aircraft about to be recovered. The purpose and focus of all this human effort and state-of-the-art technology is to enable the carrier battle group to perform its assigned mission. And what is most impressive, this airbase works because of a concentrated attention to detail practiced by everyone who's involved. About a 50,000 pound uh, cat shot. That's one a mission will begin with air wing briefings in each squadron's ready room two hours before the launch. And then it all comes together. The purple shirts, or grapes as they're known, will have completed refueling. Ordnance teams will deliver, attach, and arm the weapons to be taken along. Plane captains and the men in blue shirts will have begun preparing the mission aircraft. Will give their airplanes a final once over. The air crews strap in. The rescue helo is the first to take off. It will remain airborne nearby. The flight deck crew goes to work. The takeoff weight of the airplane heading for the catapult is shown to the pilot and to the cat officer for corroboration. The cat pressure is set to correspond to the weight demand. Hand signals move the launch forward. Aircraft are tensioned on the catapults by engaging the launch bar into the catapult shuttle, which, when the correct steam pressure is reached, will snap off the retaining link and drive the aircraft forward at launch speed. The speed of the launching sequence becomes important. An airplane is launched within every 90 seconds off the same catapult. In other words, shoot one, load it up, and shoot another. That would be 26 airplanes in 20 minutes, using just two of the four catapults. Aircraft are launched and recovered in this alternating cycle for 12 to 15 hours a day. As soon as this group is launched, the deck is immediately prepared to recover the return of an earlier mission. The recovery process. Once an airplane rolls into the groove and checks in with the LSO, the controlling LSO will tell the pilot to call the board. When the pilot sees it, he reports his name and fuel weight. The arresting wire tension is set. And another trap. They do this every 45 seconds, and they make it look easy.
the air crews are quick to give credit elsewhere. As one BN, bombardier navigator, put it, you have to talk about the massive training effort that went into getting all the new flight deck crewmen up to speed. Our job is dangerous, but being on the flight deck is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than flying the ball. Long after we've left, those guys are still on the flight deck. Nothing would move without them. And they do it in bad weather, day in, day out, 18 hours a day, whether they're dog tired or not. It just takes a tremendous individual. Coming home from a six-month deployment is, uh, is always a pleasure. Uh, but at the same time, you look back on what you've done, uh, what the mission was, and I think almost to a man uh, on board the carrier, you recognize that, that we've done what we had to do. Uh, we're not warmongers. We're not out there to uh, start wars or anything, but we're... We're there to be a presence, uh, to be a force, and uh, should we be called upon to be ready? And I, and I think we were, and I think, I think that's the tremendous advantage that this Navy has. The carrier flight deck, the focal point of the carrier battle group. From the flight deck, expanding outward to all elements that compose this unexcelled force, we are struck by the massive thrust of the potential it represents. It demonstrates total mobility and controllable power that can be directed anywhere on the globe. <laughs> 